This video is one in a series of technical tutorials produced by PlexTech RF Integration. Hello. Today we're going to talk about a 15 GHz gallium nitride power amplifier MMIC design for point-to-point -point applications. Early applications of gallium nitride were mainly military, requiring high power over a broadband. Increasingly, gallium nitride has been used for more commercial applications, becoming attractive as processing costs reduce, and due to the high power density of gallium nitride transistors, a small dye area can be achieved compared to a gallium arsenide solution. For the application we are considering, Currently commercially available parts are mainly gallium arsenide. For our gallium nitride part to be considered attractive, we have proposed the following target specification. Over the frequency range 14.5 to 15.35 gigahertz, the gain should be better than 20 dBs. The output IP3 should be better than 45 dBm at 22 dBm per output tone. It should have a um, output power capability better than 38 dBm and the power added efficiency should be better than 35%. Also the chip area should be significantly smaller than commercially available gallium arsenide parts with the same linearity. The process we'll be using for this design is Cree's quarter micron 28 volt gallium nitride process and a one millimeter device on this process can pr provide four watts of RF output power. A quarter micron gas p hemped process can provide about one watt per millimeter. So let's have a look at the layout of our one millimeter Cree device. This is here and it comprises of four gate fingers, each of 250 micrometer width. There are features of this Cree layout, such as the large spacing between the gate fingers and these three integral source wires, which help thermally. And this is required due to the high power density that the device operates at. Let's consider the corresponding process design kit model. Okay, that's here. And this is able to predict junction temperatures and the thermal effects on RF performance. In order to do this, it requires a value for the base plate temperature, which we've set to 25 degrees C and a value for the thermal resistance from the junction to the base plate. And we've used an estimate of 6 degrees C per watt for our 1 millimeter device biased at 100 milliamp quiescent from 28 volts with a 25 degrees C base plate temperature. Before we begin the design, we run a number of preliminary simulations. The first one is a small signal. Let's look at some of the key parameters from this simulation. Okay, we have maximum available gain here at the top and stability factor here. Now these tell us that um, this inflection point, which occurs at the same frequency as the stability factor crosses one, um, that above, frequencies above this inflection point um, the device is unconditionally stable. So that includes our band of interest, which is centered around about 15 gigahertz. Also, Gmax is around about 14 dBs at 15 gigahertz. And if we consider that when we match the device um, for impedance and to flatten the gain and apply bias networks and ensure stability over all frequencies, we could probably expect about 11 or 12 dBs gain per stage. Interestingly, when we look at the S22 of our 
one millimeter device biased at 100 milliamps from 28 volts. We see that if we wanted to conjugately match the, the output to 50 ohms, then a shunt inductor close to the drain would be sufficient to take us from here to here. And this is a benefit of the high voltage operation of gallium nitride. Let's continue with our preliminary simulations and look at large signal load pull. Here we have a, a test bench with a one millimeter device biased at 100 milliamp quiescent current from 28 volts. We're driving it with their power level sufficient to compress the device. And we are tuning the load at the fundamental frequency, which is 15 gigahertz. So we just run this simulation. Okay, so we have some output power contours at the bottom. Let's have a look at those. So the marker is placed on the optimum load for output power and we're getting just over 4 watts, which is just over 36 dBm. Now the load is expressed as an admittance. This is not normalised. And the imaginary part of the admittance represents a shunt inductor close to the device drain and it is essentially resonating the output capacitance of the device or CDS. So ultimately the device wants to see a real impedance of around 48 ohms which is one over this real part here. Let's move up to the uh, power added efficiency contours and the marker is placed on the optimum load for power added efficiency. Um, again, let's assume the imaginary part is resonating uh, the device CDS. So ultimately the device wants to see around about 70 ohms in order to achieve this 47.5% power added efficiency. Now this is for a single stage with ideal networks if we were to consider a multi-stage design with real lossy networks then we should expect a value less than this. We're also interested in the output IP3 and third order intermodulation performance so we have another local test bench where we use two tones. So. Here's our one millimeter device biased at 100 milliamps and 28 volts. And we are inputting two tones centered on 15 gigahertz spaced 10 megahertz apart. And they are at an appropriate power level. Again, we're tuning the load at the fundamental frequency. <laughs> I'll just run this simulation. Okay, so we have some contours over here. And the mark is placed on the optimum load for third order intermodulation distortion. And again, assuming the imaginary part is resonating the device CDS, then it ultim ultimately wants to see 140 ohms, the best or lowest rather third order intermodulation product. So we now have enough information to begin the design and we can start making some decisions. So a total of two millimeters in the output stage would be sufficient to meet our output power requirement. A two stage design would be sufficient for us to meet our uh, gain requirement. A sensible um, size for the input stage would be round about one millimeter for an appropriate drive ratio between the stages. 
and a appropriate uh, quiescent current would be round about the 100 milliamps per millimeter that we've used in our preliminary simulations. So the design was 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 begun and eventually we we developed our final schematic which is here. I'll just point out some features of the schematic. So the output stage is here and consists of two separate one millimeter device to make up the, the total of two millimeters. And we separated the devices as, it, as it's better from a, a thermal point of view. The output match is quite compact, consisting of a shunt capacitor and some series L. And placed close to each device drain, there is a uh, shunt um, inductor or, or rather implemented as a length of microstrip transmission line and this is helping to resonate with the device output capacitance. It's also a convenient point to apply the drain bias and we apply it here and it's equally biased as the, um, this bottom device as well. And we apply our, ga our gate voltage here and that bolt at the bottom and that also biases the device at the top. We have some um, network for stability here mirrored at the top and another network here and then this is our input stage and it's uh, slightly less than one millimeter at 800 micrometers. The output match is quite simple um, on the input we have some networks for stability as we had for the output stage and another network here. Okay, the quiescent current we used in the end was uh, slightly higher than 100 milliamps per millimeter at 130 milliamps per millimeter. Let's look at the uh, final simulated performance of our design. I'll just run the simulation. It takes a few moments and it simulates, uh, it simulates S parameters and um, output power at 3 dB compression and power added efficiency. Okay, so the simulation is finished. Let's look at the results. First of all, the small signal S parameters. And y you can see that the gain, S21, is um, 22 dBs or better um, across the band. And in fact, we have, we have guard band from 14 to um, 16 gigahertz. There is a nice input match, which is the blue, across our band. And the output match is here, which is the pink. Notice the, the return loss looking into the output is not as good as, the, as that looking into the input. And it's because we've matched for um, an impedance closer to that for best efficiency rather than a conjugate match. Let's look at the large signal results. So we have um, power added efficiency and this is better than 36% across our band of interest which is meeting our, our target spec. And we have the output power at 3 dB compression which is better than 38 dBm across our band which again meets our target specification. So let's look at the two-tone performance of our amplifier. Just run this simulation, it takes a few moments. What this does is 
um, about 15 gigahertz it inputs two uh, tones spaced 10 megahertz apart at various power levels and we can see how the output IP3 varies with output tone power. Okay the simulation is finished so we have the um, output tone power across the, the bottom that's the x-axis and the output IP3 on the y-axis and we've placed a marker at round about 22 dBm per output tone and this is telling us the output IP3 is 46.4 dBm. If we wished to uh, have extra margin on output IP3 there is an option to increase the quiescent bias. So we <coughs> carried this simulation out earlier. So currently we're here at 130 milliamps per millimeter. If we increased to 160 milliamps per millimeter, which is the blue, then we get approximately an extra 3 dB um, um, improvement in output IP3. And then an extra 5 dB still if we were to increase the quiescent current to 200 milliamps per millimeter. Let's look at the layout of our device. <coughs> so we have the um, RF input here. These are corresponding ground signal ground pads. The RF output is here. Uh, corresponding GSG pads. Um, we have drain bias for the output stage which can be applied here and the drain bias for the input stage which can be applied here. The um, gate bias for the input stage can be applied here and the gate bias for the output stage can be applied here. Um, these are the, um, this is the output stage implemented as two separate one millimeter devices. Um, you can see the output match it's quite compact and also we can uh, make it smaller by meandering the lines as we have done here. This of course requires EM simulation. And there are various networks um, to help with uh, low frequency stability. There's some large capacitors with some uh, dequeuing resistors here, here, here and here as well. So let's compare the size of this device to a commercially available gallium arsenide part with a similar linearity capability. So the gallium arsenide part has an outline which I've drawn here around our device and you can see our device is significantly smaller than the gallium arsenide one. So we are meeting all the uh, aspects of our target specification. This concludes our tutorial. Recall that in order to gauge linearity we used a two-tone test. In a future follow-up tutorial we'll use more realistic high order modulation signals such as 256 QAM or higher. For more information on the design of MMICs please visit our website at www.plextechrfi.com